Thank you. Thank you. Um, just sitting in the back there watching Alan's presentation, I couldn't help but think, isn't it a little odd that it's a Canadian standing in front of an international audience talking about Swedish daylight regulation? Now, many of you will think, Swedish daylight regulation, what does that have to do with me? But I think it's a very interesting case study. And I think there's a lot to learn on, for those of you who are looking to have very similar regulations in your country. Quick show of hands, how many people have been to Sweden? Okay, that's pretty good, wow. You, most of you know Sweden's a beautiful country. We're all an educated bunch here. You also know that for much of the year, it's a very dark country. Here's a look at Stockholm. Beautiful Stockholm. Um, six months of the year, it looks like this. Big advantage is I don't really have to explain to my clients what a CIE overcast sky is. I just say, look out the window. Uh, mid Midwinter, about six hours of daylight. And at six degrees uh, over the horizon, the sun, well, you could sort of call it daylight, I guess. Now, there's another thing about Stockholm uh, and some of the major urban centers in Sweden that you might not know about. There's a bit of a building boom. There's a huge housing crisis. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So this climate um, has encouraged architects to more or less, in the first half of the 20th century, treat daylight as a major driver of design. So I think when I say Scandinavian architecture, many of you expect these big windows and, and bright rooms. And but that was until the 70s. And what happened in the 70s? The oil crisis. So the Swedish government, they responded, uh, well, they restricted window sizes in the building code. And it was quite tough restrictions. Now it's often forgotten that in the building code, you could have larger windows permissible to ensure something called satisfactory daylight. It's often forgotten that part. And what do we mean by satisfactory daylight? 1% daylight factor. Now, when I talk about daylight factor, it's not the average daylight factor that most of you come to know as daylight factor. We have this magic little point, which is half room's depth, one meter from the darkest side wall, and 80 centimeters over the finished floor. Interesting when you get in a regular shaped room, how you can play little shenanigans with this little point. That's what I'll be talking about today. Now the method of calculation for doing this, as we see it's the BRS protractor, which we're all um, familiar with. Nice to see it translated into Swedish, though. So. Um, the industry, as uh, Alan mentioned previously, same in Sweden, had trouble understanding what it all meant. So there was an attempt in both the 70s and later in 88 to try to say, to explain the method and how it worked. But the industry did more or less this. They didn't, they didn't use it. And daylight, they sort of put their head in the sand, and the result was this. Small windows, a lot of dark rooms. It's very synonymous with 80s architecture in, in Sweden. Then the 90s rolled around. Uh, Scandinavia, as much of you know, had a banking crisis. Uh, the government responded with a period of deregulation, and that included the building code. And suddenly this uh, window area method popped up. Everybody knows that. Glass overfloor area. Simple as can be. Everybody loves it. 10% is what we're going to have. And when you look closely at the standard that dictates this, there's actually a lot of limitations in when you can and cannot apply this method. I don't go bother going through them. But it, it meant very seldom, actually. So very limited ap applicability. But it didn't really matter. The party was on. Regulations were lifted. And windows went a little bananas. And this might work in much of Europe. I don't know if it works in London. Uh, but with the glass technology to the day, there is problems with interior climate. It was, it's not the smartest thing for, for Scandinavia. Oh, we're going to fast forward to it. Now it's modern days, 2010s, I guess you could call it. Here's our little house. Energy efficiency measures, I think my, my, many of us are familiar. Thicker walls, darker glass, smaller windows, deeper floor plates. That works against daylight. Increasing urban density, as I mentioned, there's a big housing crisis in Stockholm. But it's not just that. There's also um, uh, a tendency to want to build denser cities, 
uh, for a lot of ecological reasons. It's not, it's not all bad, but we, we know how that affects daylight. And something which I'll go into, which is related to that, called area maximization. And there's also, I think, a little bit of architectural fashion which has come into play. Architects, maybe daylight's not as big a priority for them as it used to be. Well, I'll touch very briefly on that. So these come together to form what I would call a perfect storm. So it's not one of these things affecting a project, but it's a combination of them all together that we're dealing with. So here's the Hagestaden area in Stockholm, uh, one of the more dense areas. Well, it's the most dense area I think we've ever seen planned in, in Sweden. Um, the city, <laughs> uh, last week I had a city planning office, and, and many of them are saying, well, we think that this, um, you can see a section there. You wonder how much sky that little window down at the bottom sees. They're saying that we're not altogether comfortable with this type of planning. We know there's a housing shortage and a lot of pressure from the politicians to just build as much as we can. Construction costs are high, land values are high. But we're not comfortable with this because there's privacy issues and we know there's bad daylight. So essentially, this is a bit of an experiment to see how poorly we can do those things and still sell apartments. And, in the, and with the market right now, they, they, may, just, they may just sell them. A uh, project that's not far away, this is an office building where they filled in the courtyard. The area in gray there is the, what used to be a courtyard, and they've replaced it with three light shafts to, in an effort to, this is what I call area maximization. So within your property boundaries, trying to get the most out of the area you have. So they filled in that nice, propor nicely proportioned courtyard, and suddenly you have, well, a lot of dark office space. But, I mean, bottom line is more money. Um, it's also a detailing issue. On the left, you see the, or I'm sorry, on your, on your left, yes. Uh, you see the balconies from the 50s, how they looked. Uh, we're trying to get more space for people. People are living, you know, four or five people in 50 square meters. So, yeah, we want bigger balconies. More, all the surveys say that uh, one of the top things that people want are, are more outdoor space. Okay, we'll give them more outdoor space. The survey doesn't ask them if they want bad daylight. Well, on the right, Glazing in balconies, yeah, we get an extra room, right? Well, you know what that does to daylight. And then we've seen, because construction costs are high, we've seen a return of external balconies. And this was, again, something from the, from the 70s. Uh, and again, we know how that affects daylight. Now, I don't want to get too much into this. We're a lot of architects here. I don't want to get chased around after I walk out this door. Um, it's a, here's an example of what we deal with. I think architects, it's no longer a priority. Uh, a lot of them are more concerned with how they're facades are looking. So they design their facades, and they forget that windows, the main function is to let out, out views and light. So you get these sort of bar-coated facades, and these are not just from Stockholm, this is, is all over Europe, these, these pictures. And you get a really interesting pattern, and it, it looks great in the renderings and stuff, but in a lot of instances they've lost the, the idea to question, well, what kind of light is this guy getting? One person's got a very small window in one office, the next guy's got a uh, an office that's ten times bigger and, and, well, too big. So we frequently see daylight factors in the range of 0, 07, 0, 05, 0, 04, and occasionally one-tenth of what the required value is. And I'm not talking, uh, I'm talking about buildings with dark areas. Maybe 80%, 70% of the building's fine, but there's 30% or that's it, it's really quite far below. But there's good news. There's help on the horizon. Building certification to the rescue. Not quite. There are three systems being used in Sweden. The international BREEAM lead, which we're all familiar with, and something called Milia Bignad. There's no test afterwards. I won't ask you what that means. Um, the thing with Milia Bignad is it's a much smaller system, and it's, it's based on the Swedish codes. So the, it has a big market share because it's, less, it's more cost efficient. You get a lot of bang for your buck with that. It's, it's a nice little system. There are 16 points instead of uh, 100 like there is in Briam. I'll just translate that for you to help you out. And daylight's number 12. And the nice thing about this is it's mandatory. Because very often when I get a Briam or a lead project, it's one of the first things that goes daylight. Too expensive, you lose the credit on energy anyway, so I get the credit on daylight, but then I'd probably lose the credit on energy. Why would, I, why would I do it? Well, here you have to do it. 
And it's based on the Swedish code, that 1% that I talked about. The area method, area, window area method, but then also the daylight factor. Bit of a problem, though, we've found out is, here's the interesting case study. It's, a, it's existing property. Uh, not too bad on the um, obstruction angle. Property built, uh, I think, in the 1915. Very typical. But it doesn't... You would think that that would pass. In this particular property, th three quarters of the rooms on that lower level that we tested did not pass the 1%. So we go, uh-oh, if this doesn't pass, 90% of Stockholm and Gothenburg and Jönköping and all these other won't pass. So this got me thinking. That's not me, but you get the idea. <laughs> minimum requirement. We've got to be very careful when we set our building codes. Is the minimum requirement or best practice? So you think about the BRE 2%, which is roughly equivalent to our 1% at half room's depth. Is it best practice or minimum requirement we're talking about here? What I do know is it needs to be fixed now. I don't have time to wait for CEN standard. We have lots of problems with buildings that are trying to get certified that, that aren't even close. A lot of misunderstanding. So daylight's really come into the spotlight as recent. A uh, number of years back, it, it seemed, 2011, it seemed that there were a lot of questions. People didn't know much about daylight. There was confusion about the code. There was confusion about the calculation methodologies. So we started this group on LinkedIn. Uh, it's now over 210 members, 213 I think it is, uh, to discuss these issues. And it served, this group has served as a focus point for the code authorities, Boverket, Sweden Green Building Council who handles certifications, and the independent um, Nordic label uh, called Svanen. Recently, we, uh, five members of this group, myself, uh, Max Tilberg, uh, Eva Collen, Magnus Osterbring, who's right there, uh, and Peter Marsh, uh, we put together a report, an industry-funded report, trying to make sense of it all so people could get, gain some context. Some recommendations. We have standard inputs and better documentation. I think that one's an important one to keep in mind for everybody. But I want to just skip down to four and five. Tailored, threshold, tailored thresholds to building and room function, and that the 1% threshold needs to be examined. Uh, we're thinking about going back and looking at existing properties and see what we have for daylight factor. What have we, what have we grown up with? What are we used to in, from the 30s and 50s? What's our cultural expectation for possible daylight? <coughs> Now, I, may, I should maybe just, just say here, is when I talk daylight factor, I, we're seeing such low levels of daylight in the projects we deal, in, deal with. So daylight factor, we, we're thinking of, you, we want to use it essentially as, if it's a doctor, the doctor comes in and says, is the patient alive or is the patient dead? Because we're getting so low levels of daylight. And I know we can talk about more complex metrics for calculation. And, and, and that indicates good daylight. We're not on that level. We're on, do you have any daylight? Just to wrap things up then, I'd like some money for funding, but I'd also like some clinical evidence as to thresholds. At what point is it important? When do we get so, few, so little daylight that it's not good enough? Regulations, they gotta be easy to understand and easy to carry out. My problem with daylight factor, I just, the industry, is familiar with it. The other metrics we're not ready for yet. It has to be effectively communicated. Seminars, manuals, LinkedIn courses. The important thing is that the industry, not everybody is keen on daylight as you are. We have to see that our market is primed for this and ready and understands what we're talking about. And that's not, hasn't been the case in the past. We have to see that the thresholds, the goals are set at a readily achievable level. If I, if I put a high jump bar up here and say, I'm gonna put it this high, you know, and you wanna give it a try, you can win a million dollars, you'd give it a try. But if I put it up there, you're gonna say, no, I'm not doing that. You're gonna walk away. And that's what the industry's done. Temper your expectations. And I know, uh, again, all of us here are daylight people. We, 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 it's something that we believe in. And we want something like this, which has little teeth in our code, so we can enforce what we believe in. 
But the reality is we may have to settle for that in the beginning. <laughs> Hopefully the little one will grow into the big one. Thank you for your time today. Yeah.